Hey guys, welcome back. So today, we're working on this Generac LP5500. Uh, this is a propane only generator and was given to the channel by Gary. You know, he's already made a video on this, triaging what the issues are with this machine. So if you haven't seen it, I'm gonna leave a link to that video up above and down in the description. Anyway, to make a long story short, this belonged to one of Gary's customers and was brought to Gary when the engine would no longer run. And what Gary found was that the propane regulator had multiple issues and to be fixed properly, really needed a rebuild kit. You know, unfortunately, Generac does not make or supply said kit. Uh, the only option from Generac is to buy a new regulator, which thankfully they do sell. Unfortunately, that regulator costs $300 plus $50 shipping, tax, and of course, Gary's labor charge. So the owner wanted nothing to do with that. You know, so Gary did give him another option of using a Garretson, which would have been about half the cost. And the owner still said not interested. So he gave the machine to Gary. You know, Gary did manage to get this regulator to work, but it's not safe. And it's not something that either of us would feel comfortable selling to someone as safe. So really, we do need a new regulator. So the plan today is to rip out this regulator and put in a good one. But before I do that, you know, it's actually been a few months since Gary did the repair he did. So I'm curious if it still works. You know, if it does, we'll try getting the max out of this machine, which is 5,500 watts. And once we've done that, We'll get this up on the lift. We'll tear out the old regulator and replace it with something good. So let's check the oil real quick. I know for a fact it's full because I just filled it up with 10W30 synthetic. That was the last thing Gary did in his video was drain the oil just to realize he didn't have the right grade to put back in it. Anyway, that's always a very misleading thing in Generac manuals. It shows each oil weight and only one choice of oil for each temperature range, which isn't really accurate. A lot of manuals say 1030 is good from about zero to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. You can even use it in warmer weather, but you just got to keep an eye on it because it will start to consume it. All right, let's turn the propane on, listen for leaks. And it sounds quiet, so nothing obvious. You know, I also don't smell any propane, so I think the repair is holding. Uh, anyway, to control the engine, we use this knob right here. There used to be a label, you can't really read it too well anymore, uh, but that position says stop. That's what kills spark. That is run. And all the way over to the left is the prime function. So if you push down on the knob, it's purging the air from the line. You're supposed to hold it down for about five seconds. And after that, pull the engine over a couple times. If it starts, put it to run. If it doesn't start, switch it to run anyway. Pull it a few more times and kind of alternate between the two positions. And once it finally starts up, make sure it's in the run position and then things should be good. All right, I'm also gonna plug in the load bank so it's ready to go. Now, usually I don't load test inside the garage. You know, I don't like to run engines for longer than a minute. You know, carbon monoxide is a real concern, but a propane engine like this actually shouldn't produce carbon monoxide. Usually it'll just produce carbon dioxide and water vapor, so it's a lot cleaner. You know, that said, if it's running too rich, you know, carbon monoxide is still a concern. So I do have multiple detectors in here. If those start to creep up, as far as the counts per million, you know, I'll just shut things down.
not getting too much from this engine. It did kick a couple times, but I think that was just the propane that I dumped in there using the purge function. So yeah, maybe, maybe the lock-off valve's not working. I'm not sure. So I'm gonna pull the cover off the airbox, give a little bit of starting fluid, see if that helps any. Yeah, there is just a piece of painter's tape down here on the bottom holding the cover on the airbox. So, you know, at some point we're gonna have to take a look at that and fix it. Uh, but we're not gonna worry about that for now. Let's try that. All right, let's give this another try. Right now it's in the run position. Let's give it a few pulls. Give us a quick try. We'll start with 2,000 watts. No issues. How about 3,000? Holding fine. Let's swap the 1,000 for another two. So that brings us up to four. 5,000. Now we're at 5,500 watts. And it's holding just fine. So yeah, not too bad for a generator with a damaged regulator. Not completely clean. We are at 33 parts per million carbon monoxide, which is still well on the safe level, but that just goes to show you even something that's considered reasonably safe, like propane, isn't completely safe. You know, if the combustion isn't complete, then they do still produce carbon monoxide. Anyway, you know, as far as the testing goes, no issues. It got up to 5,500 watts without issue. So we know we have a good engine. We have a good power head, and at least on the surface, it seems like we have a good regulator, but we know better. You know, that regulator absolutely needs to be replaced. So let's get this up on the lift. We'll get the covers off the top, get the old regulator out, and then I'll show you what I have in mind for a replacement. So my initial thought when I saw this carburetor was, you know, this form factor is surprisingly identical to all the other clones that run on gasoline. So there's nothing preventing me from taking off this propane carburetor and putting on just a standard Honda clone carb that runs on gasoline. You know, theoretically, that should work. You know, I don't think there's any differences on this engine, at least physically. Uh, potentially, this has been tuned, though, to run on propane only, meaning the timing might be a little bit different, the compression a little higher. You know, those are questions I don't know the answers to. So yeah, running it on gasoline might not be a great idea, not to mention we don't have a tank for gasoline. So we would have to pull the engine out, the power head out, 
you know, drop it in on a frame that could accommodate a tank for such a thing. So, you know, I'm going to keep that in mind as a plan B. You know, I think for now, I'm going to keep this as a propane machine. And to that end, I'm going to try this. This is a dual fuel carburetor. It should bolt right on here. You know, it accepts gasoline, which we're not going to use, although I might try it just to see how it runs. And of course, it can also run on propane. Now, this didn't cost a lot. It was $41.99. And, you know, I've seen these before, and I kind of passed on them because I thought, there's no way this is going to work. And I'm still kind of doubting that it will. But for that price, it is worth a try. You know, I'm sure it will run the engine. I guess the question in my mind is, can it get up to 5,500 watts? And that I have some serious doubts on. Anyway, there's a few things I don't like about this. I guess first off, there's no instructions at all. You know, I checked online. This is actually a hippocarb. Didn't see anything on their website. And there were a couple YouTube videos, but no one really showed it in detail. And everyone that did this conversion, all they showed was that the engine would run without a load. And yeah, I, I'm very skeptical that this is going to power more than a few horsepower. So yeah, let's give it a try. So let's get the old regulator out. We'll put this one in its place and try it out. Yeah, it's not much holding this thing in. This choke mechanism right here only runs over here. We have a screw holding it onto the choke plate. So we need to get that off. We also have one wire coming over here to ground out the ignition coil so we can unplug that right now and then we have this yellow and green wire going down to a bolt right there which is the source of ground so we'll get that disconnected we will get this off the carburetor and then these lines i think we can leave in place you know they run right down to the carb so when we get the carb out of there you know this whole thing should come out as one one more connection down here for the low oil sensor so that low oil kill would have run through this switch so we'll have to keep that in mind actually because this is also the on off switch so we're eliminating this we'll need to come up with something else to shut the engine down Those were both pretty loose. so close but it's not going to fit the regulator is actually hitting the side tin uh, so for now let's just get that out of the way at least for testing let's see if this is any good and if it's good then we'll worry about modifying this
Yeah, no issues fitting now. So we'll get the governor rod back on the anti-surge spring. And the fitment's pretty good on this carburetor and it was easy to install. So from that point of view, we are looking pretty good, uh, but we do have issues and a growing list of issues. You know, besides the panel hitting right here on the regulator, we have an exhaust system that's different from most. Usually the exhaust exits out of the back. You know, in this case, we have a propane tank right there. So this one's a little different and it's run out right here. You know, unfortunately, the input for this regulator kind of crosses paths with the exhaust. So if you're not careful, you could burn a hole in that propane line and cause quite an issue. So that is something we're going to have to deal with at some point, assuming this regulator actually works. Anyway, the last thing we need to do is get a supply of fuel. Uh, this needs 11 inches of water column for the pressure. And what most people use, actually everyone that I've seen in the comments and actually in the videos I've seen on this type of carburetor, they use a regulator for a propane grill. And well, technically that'll work, you know, it outputs the right pressure. It's not going to supply enough gas at that pressure. You know, these usually max out at about 50 or 60,000 BTU and you need 10,000 BTU for every horsepower. So to produce 5,500 watts, you're going to need actually about 10 or 11 horsepower, which means you need a regulator that can produce at least 100,000 BTU, maybe a little bit more. And this one, I don't think it's going to do it. And I think most people who use this kit are going to find that when they try to load their generator up, it's going to fall on its face at about 3,000 watts. So for the sake of science, I'm going to start with a propane regulator. You know, we're going to have to cut this fitting off because unfortunately we just have a barb down here. You know, we'll get that attached, try to start the engine. Assuming it starts, we will put a load on and see how far we get with this type of regulator. And we'll say it's kind of a shame to have to cut this. It's got to be against some sort of code to hook it up this way. I just don't see how a barbed fitting is a good thing when you could have a nice threaded fitting with some thread sealant in order to avoid leaks. Anyway, I'm not sure the best way to do this, but it seems like we're making progress. Okay, let's see if it fits. Yeah, I think it will fit. I'm just going to apply a little bit of heat here to make this more flexible. And we're going to need something to clamp that on so it doesn't fall off. We're all connected to the propane. The propane is on. And I sprayed this about a minute ago. And we're not leaking. So let's lower this 
down to the ground and we'll try to start it. That was pretty impressive. It started first pull and the engine sounded great. So I give this setup actually a decent chance. Uh, that said, I'm kind of surprised that it sounded as good as it did because the input for the gasoline, you need to block that off. That is a vacuum leak and is actually gonna cause things to run lean. So let me plug that off. Uh, we'll roll this thing outside and we'll start load testing it. Let's see how many watts we can pull out of this setup. Actually, change a plan. Before I plug the fuel input for the gasoline, let's just test it. Let's see how well this engine runs on gasoline. Okay, we're nice and full. Let's try it out. It's trying. Okay, good. The engine was a little harder to start, but it did start running on gasoline and it sounded good. So that is a viable option. You know, right here, they provide a drain for the bowl. So when you're done running on gasoline, you can just drain it out and prevent that carb from gumming up. So we'll get the fuel out. And actually, you know, it's pretty late right now, but I do want to do a quick load test. So similar to before, we're not gonna run it for too long, but I do wanna run it long enough to see where we peak out when putting it under load. All right, I think we're pretty much ready to go. I've got the propane tank plumbed in, the valve turned on, and the air hopefully purged from that line. So this time there's two things I want to find out the answer to. First, what's the max wattage now with this current setup? And then second, is this regulator running the engine more clean? You know, ideally we should not be producing any carbon monoxide. So after we do the load testing, I'll shut it down. We'll double check the detectors and see where we're at. All right, let's give this a try. And I forgot to mention, I did add a fuel valve and shut it off. So that vacuum leak is plugged, at least for now. So let's give it some choke and we'll try to start it. Hopefully it starts as easily as it did last time. All right, let's give us a try. We will start with 2000 watts. It's holding, but we're already kind of slow at about 58 hertz. Let's try 2,500. It's holding, 3,000. It's doing it. All right, let's take the load off. And actually, we are kind of starting slow, about 59 hertz. So 
Let's put the 3000 back on. Let's try 3500. 4000. I'm shocked. It is pulling 4000 watts. So let's try for more. So we got the 4000 back on. 4500. 5000. It's doing it. Back to 5,000. Let's try 5,500. Wow. It's shaking. But I'm shocked it's actually doing it. That is pretty impressive. Yeah, this one's actually a little worse. 97 parts per million. So, yeah, propane, although it's clean, it still produces carbon monoxide. And that's something that you don't want to mess around with. So I've got the ventilation running in the shop right now. I'm just going to clear out, let the air clear, and come back in a second. And we can talk about what we just saw. All right, we are back down to zero parts per million. So let's talk about this for a second. You know, I fully expected this to fall on its face at about 3000 watts. And not only did it not fall on its face, but we were able to get up to the rated load of 5500 watts without issue. So this little charbroil regulator that's meant for a grill really shouldn't have been able to do that, yet it did. So between this and the cheap $41 Amazon propane carb, yeah, we're actually doing pretty well. It's far exceeding my expectations. And the other thing I just learned, which I did not realize, is that I thought this was a dual fuel carburetor, I meaning it can run on propane or gasoline. It's actually a tri-fuel. If you turn this knob right here, you can now run on natural gas. So yeah, this just keeps getting better and better. Anyway, you know, I think this is gonna be a viable solution. So. I want to get this back up on the lift. We need to come up with a more permanent way to shut the engine down. We need to do a better job plugging that off. And of course we need to modify this panel over here. I just threw this panel back in place and I was going to mark it where we needed to cut it. And what I found actually is that since the carb is fully installed and against the engine, we actually have plenty of clearance between that regulator and the front panel. So we don't actually need to modify anything here. So I'm going to leave good enough alone. You know, that said, I am not going to install the panel yet because I do need to finalize the routing on this propane hose. Uh, but for now, can't do that. This is actually too short. So I do need to buy a longer one, which will reach where the propane tank's going to be. So we'll come back to that. You know, for now, there's a few things we can fix. Uh, the first one being the air box. You know, though it's not broken physically, there is a nut that's supposed to be molded into this plastic and that pulled out and the bolt is also missing. So, you know, technically this could be fixed, but I do have a Predator air box that's complete and ready to go. So I think I'm just going to take that old air box off. We'll throw the Predator in its place. And then I guess lastly, we need some way to shut this machine down. So I've been kind of looking at the options here. And I think the easiest is just a toggle switch because you can drill a round hole with a bit, install it, call it done, but it is gonna look a little bit unprofessional. So, you know, the more OEM approach would be to install this on the side of the cooling tin, which there is a cutout for it, but it's way back in there. And once this cover is back installed, it's gonna be nearly impossible to see. So I think the best option here would actually be to cut a hole for this style switch. And we'll have it right on the front, kind of on the engine side, so you can access it pretty easily when starting and shutting the engine down. So in order to get this installed, I should remove this panel. Also these screws right here. So we'll leave the control panel behind. We'll get this panel off, measure things up, cut it, and hopefully we can get that to fit right there.
Might as well clean this up a bit while we're here. So I'm thinking we're going to want to put it right about there. I don't want to go too far to the left because that's actually going to interfere with part of the engine. So I think there would be a safer bet. And as far as the dimensions go, I guess there's two to keep in mind. One is the outer dimension, which whatever hole I cut has to be smaller than. So the width is 0.98 inches and the length is 0.18. And then if you look at the actual diameter here, like the minimum length, we're looking at one inch and the width 0.84. So we've got about 0.15 inches between kind of the smaller dimension and the larger dimension out here. So I'm gonna cut it in between and we might have to fine tune it a bit, but I don't, want to go too big because if I do then we're in a bit of trouble because I don't have a bigger switch I can use to kind of hide my mistakes so let me mark this out we'll cut it out and try to fit it It's kind of hard to see black on black, but I think it's the right size. So let's try to cut it out to that size and see if the switch fits. Yeah, I don't like the way that's working. The blade, it's walking a bit. It's also creating a lot of heat and starting to melt the sticker. So I'm gonna try a different tool, see if we can at least get a straight line out of it. Then I might have to remeasure a little bit to keep things the right size. That's even worse. Back to plan A.
So what do you think? Oh yeah, that's gonna go in there just fine. So let me clean this up. We need to do a little bit of wiring on the engine side and we should be good to go. So before I can connect this up, I do need to modify the wiring a little bit. We have one wire going to the ignition coil and we also have one wire coming from the low oil system. So this wire from the low oil system needs to be tied into this coil at all times so it can shut the engine down. And we also need another way to shut the engine down. So what I'm going to do here is actually cut these connectors off. We'll use a spade connector. These wires will be doubled up in that spade connector. So we'll always have a connection from the oil system to the coil. That'll go on one of these tabs. And then the other tab will just be connected to ground. So when you turn the switch off, that'll then ground out the coil, shutting the engine down. So let's get this fuel line off. And to plug this, I'm just gonna use a vacuum cap. I have one here that's 3 16ths of an inch, which should fit on there perfectly. And you don't need to, but I'm gonna add a fuel clamp just for extra insurance.
I'm going to remove this sticker here. It's not completely garbage, meaning some of it's useful information, but this middle bullet point, add fuel stabilizer, I think it's going to be a red flag to people wondering what or why you would want to do that on something like this. Things are looking pretty good in the front. I think we're done there as well as this side. Now, there's really not much I can do right now because I am waiting on the longer line for the propane, but I'm still concerned about this. You know, the line, even when routed in front, we still get uncomfortably close. And this line softens up real easily when it gets warm. So it makes me a little nervous. So I'm gonna remove these clamps, get the line off. I wanna see if I can get that fitting out and see if I can identify what thread that is. Because ideally I would order something up as well to take this out at a 90, you know, most likely straight down, and then we can run it across that bottom rail. Nope, not budging. And fortunately that fitting is not coming out. It is glued in there pretty good. You can see I took a little chunk off right there. So if I keep trying, I think I'm just gonna end up breaking this whole assembly down there. So swapping that out, I would say is off the table. You know, a few other options to consider would be to modify this exhaust. So instead of coming out at a 45, maybe it's more of a straight shot just away from that propane line. And another option might be to add a heat shield right here to keep that hot exhaust away. Anyway, it's gonna be a few days actually before I get the propane line that I need. So I'm gonna think about it during that time. And while waiting for that propane line, I'm actually gonna turn my attention to these top covers. The orange is quite faded. So I wanna clean this up and get a fresh coat of paint on it. Actually, I changed my mind. I'm gonna to try to bend this right now just by heating it up with some map gas. You know, I don't think this is gonna be hot enough. Unfortunately, it's the hottest thing I have, but I need to at least give it a try because I just looked up the max rating on that propane line as far as temperature goes, and it's only 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So yeah, that cannot be exiting in this direction. It has to come out more kind of perpendicular to the machine. So let me apply some heat to that and with any luck, we can just tweak it a bit to solve that issue.
think that'll do. Yeah, I think that'll do it. You know, it used to exit kind of off in this direction and now we're at a nice 90 degree angle. So that exhaust is now gonna go over here instead of shooting over this way, potentially melting that line. So like this, I think we'll be pretty safe. You know, this line again, it's gonna come out and kind of go around the front into the back side where it's cooler. So I think we're gonna be okay. Gonna apply some heat to this old sticker and just peel off what remains. Uh, we also have a sticker here, which we don't need. Looks like this was a refurbished unit, so we'll get that off as well as what remains of that sticker right there. This adhesive's really on there. I've tried a few different things. You know, my go-to is usually the goof off. Of course, I'm pretty much out. So that is not an option. Mineral spirits didn't touch it. Acetone is taking it off, although kind of slowly. So I'm gonna try to speed it up a bit. I'm thinking if I kind of break it up a bit with the wire wheel, that maybe the acetone will be more effective. You know, potentially I could just burn it off and then sand it smooth, but let's try wire wheel first.
Oh yeah, that's much better. Little bit of heat cooks it. Wire wheel takes it right off. All right, we've got the line we need. This one is 10 feet long, which is at least twice the length of the one that's already installed on this regulator. So I could just swap the lines out and call it done. You know, of course, this regulator, it's not rated for 11 horsepower. So although it performed well in the short test we did, you know, my confidence is low that it's gonna perform well over time. And to that end, I actually ordered a regulator that is a dual stage. It is rated at 160,000 BTU, which is more than we need. So I'm gonna get this loosely installed in the tank. We will route the line, get it installed how I want it, and then we'll cut it to length and finalize everything. The new hose did come with some thread sealant. You know, there's no instructions as far as how long it needs to set up. So we'll get the hose installed for now with this sealant, probably give it a day or so, and then leak test it.
The original line on this machine ran right over the top of the engine and kind of down across the front and then up into the carb. Now, most propane lines like this, they clearly state not to exceed 140 degrees. And I would think going on top of the engine will exceed that. So I am not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to route it kind of down here on this outside bottom rail across the front underneath the engine, and then we'll come up into the carburetor. Originally, I was planning on running this line down on the bottom rail and cutting across the front right here. But doing that presented a few issues. You know, first, this line was getting really close to this wheel. It was also going to interfere with the receptacles. And then running across the front here, this bracket actually, I wouldn't say has a sharp edge, but over time, I'd be worried that that could wear down on the line. So instead, we're going to run it across the top right here and down around the front. So that line is gonna stay nice and cool. It is fairly out of the way, and then it just wraps around into the carburetor. Anyway, I'm not gonna clamp down on this yet. I want the line to cool down fully. You know, for now, we'll just cut these zip ties back, get the rail and the cover back on, and then we should be ready to clamp down and bring this thing outside. All right, I think we're pretty much ready to go. I've got the load bank on standby. Now, although we know this carburetor can pull the rated loader at least close to it, you know, we haven't tested this regulator. And according to the specs, it should have no problem getting up to the rated load. So that is what we're gonna find out. So the plan is we'll just get it started, let it warm up a bit. We'll apply a half load, double check the outputs, and then apply a full load and see how it does. But before I start it, there is one last thing I want to do. You know, I did not tighten up this worm gear drive clamp, and it's really not my preferred style of clamp. This tends to dig in where these cutouts are, and the last hose got chewed up pretty bad. So I have since picked up some high pressure fuel line constant tension clamps, which admittedly is overkill, but I'd rather have something like that than 
this style of clamp. So let's get this off and swap it out for a better clamp. I'm gonna admit this is not the right way to do this. You shouldn't be stretching the clamp out. You should just remove the hose. You know, in this case, I'm not too worried about it since this is a very low pressure application. You know, all we need it to do is just keep a bit of tension on that fitting. In case you're wondering what the big difference is between this style of clamp and the one I just put on is that, you know, this one tends to dig in to the fuel line or whatever type of tubing you're securing. And also it's kind of a fixed tension. So if that tubing shrinks or if it gets kind of dug into by these cutouts here, you know, that tension is lost. And the only way you can get it back is if you manually tighten this back up periodically. You know, something like this style of clamp, it doesn't have anything to cut into the line on the sides. And if you look right here where this screw is, it actually applies spring tension to those two tabs. So even if the line shrinks, there's still tension on it. And that'll help it stay in place much better over the long term. All right, so far so good. It's nice and easy to start. So we're starting at 243 volts. Uh, the THD is at 4% and the Hertz, a little slow, 59.2. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. And the sine wave, a lot of glare. So I just put that up on the screen, but it looks like what I'd expect it to. So yeah, not too bad. So far, so good. Let's put on a load of 2,500 watts. It's doing pretty well, 243 volts. Uh, the THD, we're at 14%, so it came up quite a bit. And the Hertz, they're holding, but it's borderline. It's at 57.4. You know, that should stay ideally above 57 at full load, which I kind of doubt it will. So you know, I'm thinking we are going to have to adjust that. The sine wave, yeah, looks decent. All right, let's swap the 500 for 2000. So we're at 4000 watts. 5,000, 5,500, so it's doing it, but I think the engine is a little slow. Yeah, we're at 55 hertz, so I'm gonna take the load off. We'll adjust the engine speed and try this again. So now without a load, we're at 61.6 hertz. Voltage 243 in the THD. Actually a little bit lower at 3.8%. The sine wave looks about the same. So let's put on the 2500 watts again. THD 
CHD is at 15.6, voltage 243, so that hasn't moved at all. And the Hertz, they're holding pretty well at 59.4. And the sine wave, yeah, looks pretty good. All right, let's try bumping it up again to the max at 5,500. So we're now at 4,000 watts, 5,000, 5,500. THD is at 17.5%, 242 volts in the Hertz. Not bad, just about 58 Hertz. What do you think? Can it do more? Let's try 6,000 watts. It's doing it. So let's take these off. We'll just go for a quick 6,000, no problem. 6,500. 7,000, nope. <laughs> I can't do 7,000. 6,500 is the most it can do, which is not bad. I mean, that's 1,000 overrated. Pretty impressive. We're nice and cool. Well, what can I say other than the result kind of speaks for itself. You know, I went into this really expecting this cheap Amazon tri-fuel carb to fail my testing, and instead, it exceeded really all expectations. And yeah, for 40 bucks, you can't expect much, especially when the OEM part is over $300. In a good name brand propane conversion kit would have been about $200. You know, in this case, I have about $75 in total invested, between the carburetor, the regulator, and this propane line. And in the end, we have a machine that can actually pull 6,500 watts without issue. So yeah, this one far exceeded my expectations. Anyway, I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.